Hi everyone, welcome to researchmd.com. We got a great presentation today. We're going to teach you all about transverse myelite. It's under nine minutes, okay? It's a huge topic, but all the pertinent points will be covered. Again, my name is Premier Charet. I'm a program director, internal medicine residency, transitional residency. I teach medical students and residents, and I'm a director of research also. Okay, definition, transverse myelite is just like it's an inflammation of the spinal cord, spanning several vertebral segments, disrupt the ascending and descending neural pathways, can causing acute or subacute presentation, you can sensory motor and autonomic symptoms, okay? What is, it? let's look at a little bit, a little bit of epidemiology, uh, annual incidence um, around the one to 3.8 cases. There's uh, idiopathic and then acquired, and the acquired is like more cases, and occur any age, you got a bimodal peak, uh, 10 to 19 and 30 to 39, and it's more frequent in women. So if you look at the pathophysiology, there is inflammation uh, is going on, and then become, there's a focal collection of lymphocyte and monocytes, and then cause the damage to myelin sheet, then you have the symptoms uh, <coughs> of the presentation of the transverse myelitis. Um, in some cases, like um, you could have an immunological, but mainly this inflammatory process, the one causing the symptoms. Idiopathic, that if you're looking at the causes, idiopathic cause around 30%, we don't know what the cause is. Infectious causes, they can be virus, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. And then you had acquired or central nervous system demyelinating causes. You got neuromyelitis, optical spectrum disorders, multiple sclerosis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and the systemic inflammatory autoimmune disease. You have like SLE, antiphospholipid syndrome, Sogren syndrome, systemic sclerosis, Boucher, and neurosarcoidosis, okay? It can also be like a, due to paraneoplastic syndrome. <clears throat> you can look at the, some of the antibodies like RN, RI, and ANNA2 antibodies, CRMP, 5G, IgG antibody, anti-ficin immunoglobulin G antibody, and NMDAR antibody. It, it could be atopic myelitis the cause, could be, which is Ig mediated. And of course, there's like drugs and toxin and also causes like tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors, Chemotherapeutic agents start from gemcitabine, cytarabine, cisplatin, and sulfasalacine. And then epidural anesthesia can cause it, heroin, benzene, and brown recluse spider toxin also causes. There are reports of foreign bodies like retained glass fragment also can contribute to this disease. If you look at the clinical pictures, like in a nutshell, if you look at this picture, you can tell what's going on. It can affect the spinothalamic tract, you can have like um, the sens uh, sensory symptoms, and then you got corticospinal tract uh, affecting the uh, voluntary uh, movement, and then you got dorsal column problem with the balance and the spatial orientation. It's a good picture to kind of remember. Overall picture is in this about the presentation. Sensory symptoms, you got numbness, paresthesia, sensory symptoms. There is a clear sensory level associated with it. Motor symptoms, it could be paresis or paralysis. And you can see the below the spine cord level, usually bilateral and symmetric, and sometimes it could be asymmetric also. Associated, we already said, like also with autonomic symptoms, which is urinary incontinence, bubble incontinence, sexual dysfunction, thermoregulator dysfunction, gastrointestinal symptoms, and the cardiovascular symptoms. Like, what are the, the some of the additional symptoms you can have, like neuropathic pain um, in the dermatomal distribution, tonic spasm also seen. Um, and the other important thing is the anaconda scus. What is anaconda scus? It's a circumferential band of dysesthesia, abnormal sensation around the trunk. It's a tributary to the dermatome, just rostral to the sensory level. Then also you have this lermite phenomenon, electric shock-like sensation, travels down the back of the neck to the spine, okay? Remember those two words. Physical examination, you look for the, um, uh, uh, look for the azotocular motor manifestation. You got common demyelinating disease affecting like brainstem and the cerebellum. And then neurological examination, sensory levels, sensory examination, decreased vibration, temperature, pain, proprioception. There's always remember the word well defined tranquil sensory level, okay? That is the lost or impaired sensation below the lesion. That can help you differentiate the myelopathy from the other CNS cerebral lesions and the peripheral neuropathy. Motor, you got a pyramidal pattern of weakness in the upper and lower extremities usually present hypotonia. In the acute and the acute phases can have like a shock, spinal shock, hypotonia, increased resistance to movement, involuntary muscle spasm, and the reflexes are acutely diminished or absent in the spinal in the spinal shock phase. Hyperreflex usually develop over the days to weeks, you can have hyperreflexia. Now, what are the signs to localize the lesions? 
um, if you look at the signs, like if you have lateral corticospinal tract, you're going to have upper motor neuron deficits, okay? In the dorsal column, you have sensory deficit in the touch pressure, vibration of the proprioception. Is in the lateral, I mean, if it is lateral spinothalamic tract, you can have sensory deficit in the pain and temperature. And the intermediate lateral cell columns, you can have autonomic deficits. If it is in the ventral column, you can have lower motor neuron deficit. A nice table kind of say where exactly the lesion is. And then, if you like the superficial ab abdominal reflux also need to be checked. All reflux are present and will be present in the, if the lesion below T12, okay? Only upper and uh, middle abdominal reflux will be present lesion at the below, lesion at or below the T10 segmental cord level. And all superficial abdominal reflux will be absent if the lesion above the T6, okay? So all the superficial abdominal reflux will be gone if the lesion is above T6. Now, other reflexes like cremastic reflex, which is L1, L2 absent, then you can say a lesion is at the L2 segment code. In the bulbo cavernous reflex, S2, S4 is lesion at the S2 segment level. Anal wing reflex, you can see lesion at the S2 segment. And the Beaver sign positive is the lesion, I mean, lesion at the level of T10, 12, T10. So what is Beaver sign? You ask the patient to lie, I mean, in a supine position and then ask to flex his neck and sit up from the recumbent position. Umbilicus, you will look at the movement of the umbilicus, okay? If the umbilicus um, movement upward is a positive Beaver sign, that indicate level at T10, T12 spinal cord. And then complete transverse myelitis, you get acute or subacute spinal cord inflammation, all spinal cord tracts leading to following symptoms like paresis, sensory dysfunction, symmetric uh, loss of autonomic dysfunction. And if there's partial transverse myelitis, spinal cord inflammation localized only a portion of the spinal cord. There's few types, we're going to go really fast. There's brown sequel syndrome, dorsal cord syndrome, subacute combined degeneration, central cord syndrome, cornus medullaris, anterior cord syndrome, and spinal shock syndrome. So hemicord syndrome, you got below level, you got ipsilateral and contralateral, paresis, impure vibration, proprioception, pain and temperature sensation loss. If it is dorsal column tracts, are you got a bilateral dorsal column, bilateral loss of vibration, proprioceptive sensation, Lermite phenomenon and subacute combined degeneration tracts are usually in you know, a bilateral dorsal column and corticospinal tract, sensory loss of vibration sensation. Uh, and then central cord syndrome, tracts are involved is crossing spinothalamic fibers and corticospinal tracts, dissociate sensory loss, diminished pain and temperature, intact vibration, saddle sparing sensory um, loss, and upper motor neurex weakness. And the cornus medullaris syndrome tracks is sacral autonomic nervous are involved. Okay, can have saddle pattern of sensory loss, mild weakness, sphincter and sexual impairment is noted. In the anterior cord syndrome, you got bilateral flaccid weakness, autonomic dysfunction and pain and temperature, vibration and the proprioception sensation remains intact, and dorsal columns are spared. So when the, I mean the spinal shock in the early phase and confused with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, but spasticity, hyperreflexia, eccenter, plantar response may appear after a few days to weeks. Diagnosis, a diagnosis like uh, mainly based on the clinical and the physical examination. You can do, see, I mean, a CSF pleocytosis, a CF element, IgG level, gadolinium enhancement on the MRI is present. And the diagnostic criteria, we put a nice table right here, bilateral symmetric sensory motor autonomous spinal cord function, clearly defined sensory level, progression to nadir to clinical deficit between four hours to 21 days, demonstration of spinal inflammation, cerebrospinal tract, pleocytosis, and exclusion of the other compressive post-radiation neoplastic and vascular causes. And the complications would be many, um, could be respiratory failure, dysphagia, gastroparesis, neurogenic bladder, dysfunction, movement disorders. So first line treatment, high dose IV steroid, high dose, that's the word we're looking for. Plasma exchange is the next treatment. And then uh, you have um, the complications of the plasma exchange is like hypotension, electrolyte imbalance, and coagulopathy. So the treatment, high dose IV steroids and plasma exchange. Thank you so much for watching our presentation. Please subscribe to our channel. Thank you.